Hey guys, this is John. I thought it'd be fun to share my first ever over the board victory against a Grandmaster. I played this game in 2002 at the North American Open in Las Vegas, Nevada. That's a big annual open tournament put on by the Continental Chess Association. This game was played in round four of seven of that event. I believe the time control was 40 moves in two hours and then sudden death in one hour. And what that means is both sides had two hours to make 40 moves. And then if the game was still going after move 40, each side gets an additional one hour. And suffice it to say, that can produce extremely long games. Um, definitely not a fan of that time control myself, especially nowadays. Fortunately, most tournaments are speeding up a little bit. If you were to enter an over-the-board tournament now, a common time control might be game in 90 minutes with a 30-second increment. But just wanted to give you some background on the time control. So I had the black pieces in this game. I was a FIDE master at the time. My rating had recently crossed 2300, which is the threshold for FM. And I was 16 years old. And I had played Grandmasters before, but had never taken one down. And I was up against Grandmaster Pavel Blotny. He is from the Czech Republic. I believe he was in his early to mid 30s, probably closer to early 30s at the time this game was played. And he is known for having a very quirky style. He loves to play flank openings, uh, b3 and b6 for white and black. Uh, also f4 on move one, the birds opening. And before you take a look at the game itself, Let's just see, <laughs> yeah, who's involved in this game. You can see Mr. Blotney on the left here. This is uh, from the New York Masters, which was a tournament uh, weekly series of events in New York City that, that took place for a while. Kind of talks about his opening repertoire. Yeah, just very innovative, unorthodox player. And on the right, you see this studly fellow here. This was taken, actually, uh, when I was 18. These are my high school graduation photos, one of them at least. <laughs> they didn't all involve a chessboard, but I couldn't find couldn't find a picture of me age 16 on my computer, so you have to settle for uh, for that one. <laughs> so let's take a look at the game. Blotney opened with B3, true to his style, and I didn't remember being particularly nervous for this game. As I said, I had played Grandmasters before over the board and online. I knew that Blotney was, you know, an unusual type of player, so I think I just resolved to play normally. You know, the advice I give to you guys, especially when you're up against unfamiliar openings, just try to play normal moves. Don't attempt to refute the opening. So I played e5, and Blotney played bishop to b2, fianchettoing, knight c6, defending the e-pawn, e3. I played knight f6. He played bishop b5, all standard stuff. So now white has a threat of taking on c6, followed by taking on e5. So I played a move that was often recommended at the time, uh, bishop to d6 developing and defending the pawn on e5. This is a bit awkward looking because I do block my d pawn. And, you know, this is a move I wouldn't recommend to beginners that you play too often, blocking your pawn in that way. But it does facilitate castling. And often Black's plan is to castle, put a rook on e8, and then move the bishop back. And actually pay attention to this bishop throughout this game because it does get a workout. Uh, Blotting played d4 here, which I don't think is that great of a move. I think knight a3 is a more promising idea for white. Developing the knight to the edge of the board, but trying to come to c4, where white can exert pressure on both d6 and e5. But nevertheless, d4 was played. e takes d4, e takes d4. I castled. Blotney played a3, controlling the b4 square, but I think this is a bit time-consuming, and I think already black has a good position here. I played rook e8 check. I have a nice lead in development. Knight e2. And now I move my bishop back to f8 so as to unblock my d-pawn, getting ready for d5. Uh, the engine already proposes uh, a combative continuation for black. It says I should just throw my knight into g4. So looking to create threats on h2 or possibly even f2. And then a sample line is h3, queen h4, using the pin here. Also threatening queen takes f2. And if white were to castle, now play bishop h2 check king h1, and then d5. Just keeping the knight here, and there's no immediate devastating threat, but white will at all times have to consider knight takes f2, and white can't take this knight because I have this typical mating idea to move the bishop and then play queen h2, checkmate. So the engine is already very optimistic about black's chances here and wants me to play knight g4. But I just retreated the bishop back to f8, and Blotney played knight d2. I played d5, Blotney castled, 
And I played bishop f5, so getting my light square bishop into the game. Blotny played knight g3, attacking the bishop on f5. I played bishop g4, hitting white's queen. And I was trying to induce white's next move, f3. So that creates certain weaknesses. Uh, the e3 square is no longer covered by white's pawn. This diagonal in general, general becomes a little bit tender for white. So sometimes you can use your bishops in that fashion. Play a bishop into your opponent's half of the board, often threatening their queen or another piece, and try to induce them to make a weakening pawn move. So now I played the bishop back to d7, and Blotny played bishop to d3, retreating his own bishop. Probably decided that he wasn't going to take on c6 at this point. If he intended to capture that knight, it would have made sense to do it earlier, because uh, he could have doubled my pawns. But trying to keep his bishop here. And now I put the bishop back on d6. Now that I had unblocked the d-pawn and developed my light square bishop, got my rook to e8, I decided to put the bishop here, kind of similar to what white is doing, get it bearing down on this diagonal. Blotny played rook f2. Kind of a funny looking move, but it does make a square for his knight to transfer to f1. Here I played knight e7. Blotny played knight df1. I went knight g6, so I'm also transferring, transferring a resource over to the king side. Blotny played knight f5, so diving into a square that I sort of newly weakened. And once again, for the second time this game, I play bishop to f8. So preserving my bishop. Also possible to take this knight, I think. Play bishop takes f5. And then maybe even try to get aggressive, something like knight h4. But I was looking to hang on to my bishop pair. So bishop f8. Blotny played g3. Now, I mentioned earlier this diagonal, and having played bishop to g4, inducing white to play f3, and thereby weakening that diagonal. So with my next move, c5, I'm looking to take advantage of that and kind of remind white, hey, if ever there's a capture here, my bishop can make an appearance on the g1, a7 diagonal. So Blotny did not capture. He played knight 1 to e3. And now here again, I think I played a logical move, rook to c8. Backing up my C pawn, hinting at the idea of C4 as well. I think B5 was also a pretty good move if I wanted to prop up C4 in a different way. But I played Rook to C8. Blotny played Queen to D2. And I did go ahead and play C4. So gaining a little space. This move comes with tempo against the bishop. There's no longer any tension here, but that means I won't have to worry about White's dark square bishop getting unleashed anytime soon. And the tactical justification for this move, if you haven't seen it already, is if white takes, let's say they play this, then the knight on e3 is overloaded. Okay, it's trying to defend both of these pieces. And I can exploit that. Bishop takes f5, knight takes f5, rook takes c4. Black wins a piece. Or if white takes with the knight, very similar. Uh, now this bishop on d3 is overloaded, trying to defend both knights. I can play bishop takes f5, bishop takes f5, rook takes c4. So... That's the tactical justification for the c4 move. Blotny played his bishop back to f1. And now here, I played queen to b6. Getting the queen off of the back rank. Also attacking b3 twice. Blotny played b4. So releasing further tension on this side of the board. And now I played knight e7, looking to try to swap this knight on f5. I think that's by far white's best piece. Whereas my knight on g6 looks restricted by virtue of white's g3 pawn. So knight e7 made good sense to me. And now Blotny played knight h4. And I went right back to g6 at this point, offering a repetition of moves. So he could play knight f5 and repeat. And this was a mini theme in this game, uh, repetitions that is. And I've used this with success against grandmasters before. Uh, oftentimes in these open events, these grandmasters are so incentivized to try to beat you versus drawing or obviously losing. So they will take considerable risks. And if you offer a repetition, they may avoid it just on principle because they're thinking of nothing less than the full point. So knight g6 just seemed like a normal, normal way to offer a repetition. Uh, if white plays knight f5, I would have the option of knight e7 or doing something else. You know, the old Ben Feingold advice, always repeat, right? Uh, also the old Soviet advice. So this kind of worked to my advantage this game because here Blotny played knight h to g2 and this actually becomes a problem for him later on, this relatively poor position for the knight. I think he should have just swapped here. 
or even gone back to f5. But he played his knight to g2. And now again, I put the bishop back on d6 for the third time this game. <laughs> so making a reappearance on the square. And now I really like my bishop's position bearing down on this pawn structure. Although it won't matter until I can get more pieces and pawns involved on that diagonal. But stay tuned. So bishop to d6. Blotney played bishop to c3. Maybe just looking to block any pawn to c3 business. Also helps him strengthen the, the e1 square. Pawn c3 is not yet a threat. He does have that covered twice, and I only have it defended once. But he probably figured just stop that threat and, yeah, overprotect e1. Now I played queen c7. Now that there's uh, nothing to worry about on the b, the b file, and white has played b4, I don't think my queen has a whole lot to do on b6 anymore. So back to c7. Blotney played bishop to e2. And here, I played a, a useful strike against white's king side. I played h5. Looking to advance h4 and try to create a weakness in white's position. I already have my queen and my bishop doubled up here. So h4, h5, h4, very natural way to try to capitalize on that. Blotney played knight f1. So you can see there's a lot of jostling with his minor pieces. I definitely have a space advantage at this point, and this is where I think you know his decision to play, for instance, knight g2 kind of comes back to bite him. Given that white is more cramped here, you can see, yeah, I've got this pawn extended into black's position on c4. My minor pieces are working better. Uh, exchanges probably would have favored white relative to black, so he probably should have traded my knight on g6 when he had the chance. And now the engine already gives black a decisive advantage at this moment. Uh, this is a bit of a confounding game to analyze because the engine thinks extremely highly of my position for the next five, 10 moves or so, but there's not like a, a concrete tactical way to win material. It's kind of this slow burning advantage. So the engine says I should just play H4 here. And I think it was already saying plus two and a half or plus three or something for black, but Evidently, I decided it wasn't time to strike yet, so I played the bishop into h3. So this could be helpful if ever I want to play bishop takes g2 in conjunction with h4. Further weaken uh, white's king position, perhaps, or if this knight moves, maybe having the option of taking the knight on f1, which is also trying to defend g3. So bishop h3. Blotney played rook e1, so he finally gets this rook over. And I did go ahead and play h4 here. And I'm not too concerned if he takes this pawn because let's say he plays knight takes h4. That's really asking for trouble. Knight takes h4, g takes h4. And not only is his structure a mess, but also I can play bishop f4. And this queen is rapidly running out of good squares. So say he plays queen d1. What Black is down one pawn here, but fantastic compensation. Um, not exactly sure how I would play this position. Taking and following with bishop e3 certainly looks natural. I could try something slower, maybe knight h5, move the bishop away and try to get the knight into f4, or transfer a piece, major piece onto the sixth rank and maybe try to go rook g6. It seems very difficult for white to work their way out of this. So in a nutshell, I'm not worried about white playing g takes h4 or knight takes h4. So Blotney instead played queen to g5, getting the queen involved in the defense of g3 because I was attacking g3 now three times, pawn, bishop, and queen behind, and it was only defended twice by the h-pawn and the knight on f1. So he decides to try to hold this point. Also note that f4 trying to block the queen bishop battery would fail to knight e4 with the fork. So definitely can't do that. So queen g5. And now here again, I repeated the position a couple of times. So. I played knight to h7, trying to drive the queen away from the defense of the g-pawn. Blotney played queen h5, kind of a clever move to pin my pawn. So if I take here, he can take back. And I can't yet cash in here because of this. And I guess I could get the rook on f2, but it's not exactly what I was looking for. So queen h5, looking to take advantage of this uh, pin on the h-pawn. And now here I played the knight back to f6. He went queen g5, and I played knight h7, offering to repeat again. And here, Blotney makes the decisive mistake. This is move 31. Had he played queen h5, which is definitely the best move. Again, the computer thinks very highly of my position, but under the circumstances, and I wish I remembered what the time situation was, but 
despite having two hours for 40, 40 moves, you guys know me, I was probably under some sort of time duress getting close to move 40. Uh, I can't honestly say that I would have gone for the win had he played queen h5. I might have been satisfied with a draw, you know, being outrated by um, 150 or 200 rating points, playing a grandmaster with the black pieces. I might very well have just said, all right, let's repeat the position and draw and been satisfied with that. Um, I'd like to say that I would have found something and gone for the win, but just as an example of what is best here for black in this position, the engine thinks bishop e7 is very strong here, which confused me at first when I was analyzing this game now in 2019, many years later. But the point is to try to threaten knight f6 back, and then if queen g5 played knight e4, okay, so let's just say white plays some random passing move, a4. White wouldn't play this, but just to illustrate it. So this would be the idea. Be able to use a discovery, try to drive that queen away, but most importantly, attacking other pieces too. So kind of a subtle move, and I don't know under time time duress if I would have found something like that. There's other moves too. I think queen d7 was another move that the engine liked. Uh, but complicated position despite the objective large advantage for black according to the engine. But all that was unnecessary because Pavel Blotny captured the pawn on d5, which you might have been wondering about. So when I played knight h7 a couple moves ago, he also had this option way back here. But to me, this decision taking the pawn on d5 seemed suicidal. Yes, he captures the center pawn. His queen is nicely centralized, but he gives up the g3 pawn. So remember, the queen went to g5 in order to protect g3 sufficiently. So I immediately cashed in on that. I played h takes g3, h takes g3, bishop takes g3. Nice pair of bishops side by side here. Knight takes g3, queen takes g3. And this is a desperate position already for white. Maybe Blotny was intending to play bishop takes c4 here, nab this pawn and try to attack f7, but I have many good moves against this. Uh, one that's pretty effective right away is bishop to e6, retreating this bishop and turning the tables on white on this diagonal, because if the queen moves, I'm going to take here. And if rook takes e6, sacking the exchange, I think this is just going to be winning for black. F takes, attack the queen. The queen still needs to defend the bishop. I have a knight that can come to g5 very soon, which you'll see in a second. This is a winning position for black. So kind of get the sense that he was intending to play bishop takes c4 here. But instead, he played bishop f1, so trying to reinforce g2. And now the floodgates open, and my initiative really begins because white's king has already been stripped of some key defenders with those pawns. And now I start capitalizing on that. So I played knight f4, hitting the queen on d5, also attacking g2 again. White has enough defenders of g2 for now, but nice move to play, gaining time and uh, including another piece. Blotney to queen to b5. And now this position makes for a nice little puzzle. So black to move. If you'd like to find the strongest continuation, you can do so now. Okay, so there are multiple good continuations here. The engine believes that rook takes e1 is the strongest line. It wants to play rook takes e1, bishop takes e1, and then knight g5 with decisive threats, especially on f3. Uh, does get a little complicated. White can play queen takes b7 and defend this pawn. I think the line goes rook e8, threatening the bishop down here. White's just extremely passive here, even though white's up a pawn. Bishop to d2, and then black can even take here. And things start to collapse really fast because I'm looking to put a knight in on h on h3, for example, like this, and then go take the the rook on f2. This bishop is pinned. So that is one way to capitalize if you went for rook takes e1. I really like the move I played. And after I played this new, this move, I knew I was going to win this game. So I played bishop to d7. An unexpected retreat. But blocking white's double attack on the e8 rook. So you know, white is threatening, rook takes e8 here. And leaving the bishop on pre. So white could take it, but the point is I freed up the h3 square to bring my knight in with that fork. So Blotny did take on d7 here. And I played knight h3 check. He played king h1. Knight takes f2 check. King g1. I pivoted the knight back to h3 check. King h1. And now, no repeating at this point. Again, I knew my position was decisive here, so... Uh, I don't want to take the rook on e1. He is still double attacking the rook on e8, but I don't want to take here because he will play queen takes c8 check, and that would be a good way for me to lose this game. 
<laughs> so instead, I just played rook e to d8, gaining time. You know, the initiative and the attack, it's all about time. Can you keep your opponent under pressure, creating threat after threat? So I stopped white's idea here, and I threatened the queen, which white must respond to. He took this pawn on b7, and now I gave another check here, knight f2. This was move 40, by the way, with knight f2, so now we even got some extra time on the clock. Again, I don't really remember if I was in that bad of time pressure, but I'm sure that was a, a bit of a relief as well, just to know that I got an hour extra on the clock here. So king to g1, and now I included this other knight, knight g5. I was mentioning this move in several other lines, and finally it makes an appearance with, with deadly effect because I'm threatening knight h3 checkmate, knight g to h3 checkmate, that is. Uh, also threatening knight takes f3. This is more than white can handle. So Blotney played bishop e2, overprotecting f3 and making room for the king to come to f1. I gave a check on h3 with the g knight. He played king f1. And I'll give this to you guys as a final quiz. If you'd like to find the winning move for black, feel free to do that now. Okay, so if you said any move with this knight on f2, congratulations, that's a winning move. Uh, yeah, black can go anywhere with this knight. h1, g4, e4, d1, or the move I played in the game, knight d3, they're all decisive. I think this one is technically best because it wins fastest. It shuts down white spike checks right away, but essentially queen f2 checkmate is unstoppable here. Um, the only thing white can do is give up the queen with check to try to delay it by a move, but... Yeah, after this, there's just no stopping queen f2. I've got g1 and e1 covered. White can't get another defender on this square. So, yeah, knight d3, nice move to play, uh, attacking the f2 square. And again, any any move with the knight works, but that would allow just a couple more spite checks, stuff like this, before white might have to resign. I guess in this case, white might get bishop e1. So, in the game, after I played the decisive knight d3, Pavel Blotny did resign on move 43 here. And I had my first ever over-the-board victory against a Grandmaster. It was a great feeling. I remember feeling just this kind of numb confidence and this um, assurance, really, that Grandmasters are human as well. And they make mistakes and they overpress, as Blotny did in this game, overestimate their position. Um... The circumstances in which I won this game, I mean, they de it definitely felt nice at the time to find moves like bishop d7. I guess the one thing I think about is that repetition before, right before time control. And, you know, had he not played that extremely reckless, just downright losing move, queen takes d5, and instead played queen h5, would I have gone for it? I kind of think I wouldn't have. So I think I probably would have repeated and made a draw, uh, which would have been a shame when I looked back at the game later and seen the evaluation being so strong for black. But that's kind of the psychological effect of playing Grandmasters. So I ended up having a really good tournament at this event. In the very next round, I played Grandmaster uh, Mikulevsky, Victor Mikulevsky, and I, I made a draw with him from a very bad, I think just losing position down two pawns. I ended up winning a, a pretty big cash prize for my rating category in this event, 2002 North American Open. So I hope you guys enjoyed this analysis. Um, again, getting... A Grandmaster Scalp at age 16 was just a, a memorable moment in my chess career. I'd like to share more games that I played against Grandmasters on my channel, so I think I'll do that uh, in the future. So let me know if you guys have any comments on this game. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll be back again soon with another video.